my presentation today is just an overview of wooden boat building. Um, and you can hear from my biography what my background was. Uh, having served on the USS Pledge back in the uh, early 90s was a lot of fun and probably one of those jobs that the Navy really uh, didn't know too much about at the time because I was stationed in Seattle with uh, 55 active duty guys and 25 reserves and it was more fun than you're supposed to have a, in a Navy tour. It was just, it was fantastic for a lot of reasons, not the least of which was Seattle, a chance to learn about reserve people, uh, getting to sail around wherever we wanted in the Puget Sound. It was, it was one of those really memory inducing tours. So what I'm gonna to do today is I'll give you an introduction <clears throat> and a quick biography, some of which you've heard, and then I'll talk a little bit about uh, ways to begin wooden boat building, methods of construction, what do you really need to get into it as an amateur, uh, which I consider myself to be, uh, some answers and questions, and then some references and links. So uh, I've already told you that I was on active duty in the Navy for 27 years, 1976 to 2004, primarily on board ships. Uh, all steel hulls, everything from uh, frigates to destroyers to the large communication ship and aircraft carrier, that kind of stuff, all steel until 1990 when I showed up on USS Pledge in, in Seattle. Um, and minesweepers were and are built of wood because they're invisible to sea mines. So we were taken care of and largely by the uh, Lake Union Dry Dock and Shipbuilding Corporation in Lake Union, or LUD, as it was called in LUD built the dream boats back in the 1920s, which was my introduction to wooden boats and the Puget Sound. And uh, not only did I get to hang out with people who knew all that stuff, I actually got to serve on a wooden ship. And so it kind of really got into my blood at that time. So when I retired in 2004 from the Pentagon where I'd gotten stuck in Washington, DC, I said, I don't wear a, want to wear a coat and tie anymore. Uh, I'm done with that. I want to move back out to Washington state, God's country and, and get into wooden ship building or boat building. So uh, we sold our house in Fairfax, Virginia and moved out here to Port Ludlow. And the first course I took was the introduction to contemporary boat building at the Northwest School of Wooden Boat Building in Port Hadlock, which is uh, down on the waterfront in Port Hadlock across the street from the Ajax restaurant. Uh, had a lot of fun with that. And uh, the next year I took traditional small craft construction, which is boats up to 20 feet roughly. Uh, traditionally built, which I'll show you. And then the year after that, I said, what the heck, might as well take the third one. So I took the third course, which is large craft. So uh, in the middle of all that, of course, I served on as a board of directors or photographer for a while, uh, wrote a lot of articles about the school and boats and students and that kind of thing. Ended up buying a 26 foot tug that they built back in the late nineties for, owned that for three years. Uh, repaired a bunch of small skiffs and dinghies just to keep my hand in, built an Elliot by Darko, which I'll show you with my wife. She built one and I built one. Uh, built an 18 foot skiff for my brother, assisted in documentation of boats for the National Archives, basically the historic American engineering record, which was very interesting, and a lot of fun. And uh, now I'm restoring the 47 foot cruiser riptide. So why wooden boats? Why, why does that attract me? And the answer is, well, there's lots of different challenges in wooden boats. Uh, it's a three-dimensional woodworking problem for one thing. Uh, I get to learn and practice new skills practically every day when I'm out in the shop. Um, I learn better from books than I do from websites. So there's usually a book out there to show me what I have to do and it takes me three or four times but I do get to practice and build my hand skills instead of sitting in front of a computer all day. Uh, I got a BA in history back in college and I've always been interested in history. So uh, boat building gives me a chance to uh, be involved in history as a member of the Pacific Northwest Maritime Heritage Council and uh, be involved in old plans, uh, traditional ways of repairing things. I'm a tool collector, uh, getting to understand who the builders were and what they built and uh, what their methodologies were. Um, it's a good project to teach kids tool use. I taught my kids that. Um, pretty basic stuff, but my son is now engaged in that in the, at a college out on the North Carolina mountains, uh, taking care of the buildings and grounds for a college out there. I like to be able to look at something and say, well, I built that or we built that. It's kind of fun that you made something that wasn't there before. And uh, a boat gives you a chance to explore new horizons. So your horizons can be rivers, ponds, lakes, the Puget Sound, uh, the Salish Sea and beyond out into the Pacific. So 
Um, I did a lot of deep water, blue water sailing on uh, steel ships when I was in the Navy. And so I kind of like the Puget Sound because you can always see the shore. There's always something interesting to look at. Uh, if it gets a little bumpy out there, I can pull in somewhere because I don't really like being tossed around out of rough water. So it's just a, a good way to be involved in all that. We're going to look at uh, schools, plans, and kits. And I'll mention uh, personal designs, which I prefer not to be into. Uh, you don't really need any expertise to get started. You just need a lot of curiosity and stick to it uh, There's lots of different schools. Uh, and I checked out most of these schools before I moved from Virginia. Um, I didn't even know the Northwest School of Wooden Boat Building was here when I was stationed in Seattle back in 1990. So I learned about it um, by mail basically in those days. And uh, then there's Iris in Newport, Rhode Island, Cape Fear, North Carolina and so forth. Uh, all good schools. I just happened to like the Northwest and the uh, programs at the school in Port Hadlock had looked interesting and useful to me. So when I came out, I re wasn't really sure what I wanted to do. Um, the Navy is sort of an intensive thing. So, I mean, it's 24 hours a day, especially when you're on a ship. And uh, I kind of leaned into the, I hate to call it a hobby, but that's really what it is. Uh, I wasn't really too interested in making it a career, but, there, but the school that I went to is accredited and uh, they are focused on putting people into a career in wooden shipbuilding or boat building repairs or uh, lots of other wood construction related kinds of things. And so uh, I focused on the boat building part of it because at that time the school did not have a systems course, but now they've got both an electrical and uh, diesel systems courses, which is fantastic for our area and uh, a real reflection of the current director there. Uh, job prospects. Um, if you're a wooden shipwright, it is a very skilled job. It takes a while to learn all the things and you really start at the bottom sweep, sweep in the shop. Uh, wages start around $18 an hour for people coming out of the school. And uh, it really is limited only by their uh, imagination and their, their drive and enthusiasm for the job. Um, so as I went through the course, I pretty much settled on the fact that uh, I didn't think I was going to be in my early 50s laying in the shipyard knocking out keel bolts, as I used to say, although that was always fun. Uh, so I deferred from using it as a job and pursued it as a, as a personal interest or hobby. So my perspective is uh, when you're starting into wooden boat building and you don't know anything at all, which is definitely where I started, I felt more comfortable starting with plans from a recognized designer understanding that I really didn't know a lot about what I was doing, so I started simple and small. Uh, in other words, not trying to build a 47-foot boat first, but starting to understand how to put together an eight-foot boat because, for one thing, it's a whole lot cheaper when you make mistakes, and I'll guarantee you that I made a lot of mistakes, and it cost me some money burning up plywood sheets and you know cedar planks and the rest of that kind of thing. Uh, the, the basic question is, do you want to go traditional or contemporary? And I started with contemporary and went into traditional so that I could understand both of them. Now, uh, these are for anybody that wants the, the copy of my presentation, you're welcome to it. But there's all kinds of designers out there. And I feel very strongly that recognized designers are really important because boats are not like cars. You can't step out of a boat and walk to shore. And so you need to have a boat that's going to keep you safe in the environment that you're planning to use it. So boats that are designed for rivers or near shore, not designed for out in the ocean and so forth. And uh, a lot of these skills have been developed over a long period of time. And so I don't think that, uh, and once in a while I do run into people who say, well, I'm going to design my own boat. Well, that's great. But unless you really understand what you're doing, start with somebody else's design and learn from them. I don't think you need any expertise to get started at all. Uh, you just need a lot of curiosity and a willingness to, to uh, stick to it. A, a basic familiarity with plans is nice, but it's not mandatory. You can learn how to use hand tools, one hand tool at a time. Uh, not only are there hundreds of books to help that, but now with the YouTube, you can look up anything on YouTube, for example, and step-by-step step find somebody who will show you at your elbow patiently and as many thousand times as you want to show you how to use every single tool. Um, you don't need a lot of tools either. A basic kit of hand tools works. Boats. This is a little sheet plywood dinghy that this young lady built. 
She's rowing out of Port Thompson rowing one of the boat festivals. This is one of the small, uh, more traditionally built boats that was built at the school. Bruce Blatchley is one of the instructors. This is a sailboat called the Scamp, owned by a friend of mine. Uh, it's 11 feet, 11 inches long. It's a kit, or you can build it from scratch. It's plywood. Uh, you can actually <laughs> sleep two adults in that little boat comfortably or uh, carry four adults. So there's really no limit to what you can do uh, in an average size garage. Uh, this is a very popular West Coast power boat. It's got a little inboard diesel engine, but some, some people put uh, outboards on it. It's also a sheet plywood boat. Uh, these boats look complicated, but if you look at the hull, for example, you'll see it's not too complicated. It's basically built around one or two forms and sheets of plywood are used to construct it. So you take the whole process one step at a time, learning as you go. Uh, kayaks and canoes are always fun. There's all kinds of different kinds. My wife is on the right with the two by dark as we built. Uh, by dark is our, our Aleutian type boats built by the Aleuts out on, the, out on those islands off Alaska. Um, they're built completely differently than, than uh, any boat that I've built before. Uh, and they weigh about 20 pounds. Her boat weighs about 18 pounds, believe it or not. Uh, she could lift both of these quite easily with either hand. They're covered with uh, neoprene canvas, basically. And I'll show you a little bit about that later on. Um, Pygmy Kayaks is also located in Port Townsend, and they, they have the kits that you see on the left. So there's lots of different variations. So traditional construction methods, uh, I wouldn't worry too much about the terminology. I'll show you this as we go along. But uh, the traditional method, the way it's been done for 500 years, carbell planking, which is edge joint traditional planking, lap strake, which is like flatboard on a house, planks overlap each other. And there's lots of different contemporary construction methods. Sheet plywood glued lap strake, which is epoxy, a strip planking, modern skin on frame, which is just basically a synthetic skin over a wooden frame like the alley by Darkas, or you can veneer both. Uh, levels of detail, I'll just pass through this quickly, but, but uh, builders 200 years ago really didn't use plans, not for uh, small boats anyway, they used half models. So the, the builder would carve a half model that was about 18 inches long or thereabouts, and the model was half a boat split down the middle and they would take a piece of lead, lead uh, cane and they would measure the boat that way and then scale it up full size. Uh, as boats got more complicated, they went to what's called the table of offsets where a designer draws the boat and then reduces the boat to a series of, of uh, dots and space. I'll show you that. Um, so sometimes in the old magazines, for example, all you get is a picture of the boat and a table of offsets because the builder was expected to know how to use all that stuff. But today, we don't know how to use all that stuff. So the amateur builder gets a very detailed set of instructions step-by-step, step, usually in book format, uh, sometimes as many as 150 or 200 pages so that the builder can see every single step with all the questions. And many of the designers are available for free consultation on the phone or by email. A friend of mine lives in New Zealand, John Wellsford designed the little scamp sailboat. And when builders have a problem, they send John an email and John responds to every builder's email around the world. So it's, it's quite impressive what they're able to do. Uh, sometimes instead of scale drawings, you get an actual full-size drawing for a part, for example. Um, and there's lots of uh, YouTube people out there that want to tell you how to do it, but I would like to stick to the people I recognize uh, because sometimes the amateur builder who thinks they know everything on YouTube isn't the best one to watch. So we just talked about plans. There's a picture of a half model. Uh, built by a student at the school. Uh, in the old days, the builder would then take the half model and scale it up to a full-size plan. Table of offsets is actually a pretty simple. You just start with a baseline, which is just a line on the floor, and then you, or on your piece of paper that, that the designer gives you, and then the designer draws the boat out uh, and then picks out a series of points along those lines and then defines those points from the baseline in terms of how far they are away in inches and feet. Uh, and then you make patterns from the curves that you draw. It's pretty simple. Traditionally, uh, the designer would give you that table of offsets, which is sort of a paint by number kind of a thing. And then the builder takes that 
set of offsets, which are drawn from the designer's piece of paper and scales them up full size on the floor. So if you have a 12 foot boat, the builder gives you a sheet of paper that's 12 inches or 18 inches long and you build, you scale that up from the, from the design and the offsets. And the reason you, for the scaling it up like that is because the designer might make a mistake and be one pencil dot different from where the line is. And you'll see that when you blow it up to full size on the floor. So you, as the builder, adjust your lines to meet what the designer wants. Does that make sense? Sometimes a pencil, the pencil line is enough to throw off the curve of a design. So you don't slavishly follow it. You set it to make it look right, to make the line fair and a nice curve. Uh, lofting was kind of fun. It was uh, definitely get down on your hands and knees or, or set up the board on, a, on the side. And the way, uh, the way that boats and aircraft were designed all the way up to the 747 where they were all lofted. So the Titanic at 883 feet long was lofted in Belfast, Northern Ireland. Uh, individual plates in her hull were all lofted. You can loft every part of a boat if you want. Uh, but major, the hull is, is lofted. Plates, if you're building in steel, were lofted at that time. Um, and sheet metal workers often lofted their, their uh, designs for inside of buildings and the rest of that, because it's just easier to figure out how much steel you need or how much aluminum you need. With uh, CAD design, which is what a lot of people use now, is that lofting is really a specialty thing and not very many people know how to do it. Although there's plenty of books to show you step by step. So now when you get it, you get a set of, sometimes you get actually the plans cut on paper, but more often you can actually buy the entire boat cut in a kit format by CAD. And the designer draws it in CAD and it's scaled up in CAD, so there's no errors. Or the errors are on the, on the order of 100, there may be 1 64th of an inch. I thought it might be interesting just to look at the loft floor where Titanic was actually lofted. And if you look way in the back of the picture, you see three lost people working back there. So this is a huge building. The whole ship was lofted on that floor. And if you look carefully at the picture, you can actually see the lines of the bow coming up towards you, uh, drawn in chalk on the floor. So then they would make a pattern and they would pick up that, those pieces that they needed to make and then they would fabricate it either out of wood or out of steel. And usually you see the patterns laying on the floor, but in this case, they've got a temporary floor laid down which is pretty amazing actually, when you think about it. So these are the molds. After you uh, draw out your lofting on the floor, you draw your boat in three dimensions. So you draw it, looking at it from the side, you draw the same drawing using the same points as though you're looking down on the boat from above. And then you draw a picture of the boat from the front and the back. You lay all those drawings usually over top of each other, traditionally. And uh, for those of us who are more modern, you like to lay them out separately so you can see them all. But all those dots all connect to each other. And so if you think in CAD, for example, if you're going to change the line on the side of the boat, or that line is going to change the, the way the boat looks as you look down on the top of it. So the points are all connected to each other. And the molds you build as though you're looking at the boat from the front directly on, you know, bow on. And the mold is just a temporary form that holds the boat in space. So you can imagine the planking will attach to the sides of the molds basically to hold that planking in place while you're building the boat. Once you're done with making the boat a three-dimensional object and you're ready to work on the inside, you take all those molds out and toss them aside. You don't need them anymore. They're just temporary. So the one major picture you see in the middle is the mold being laid out on the lofting floor. And the one on the left is a larger boat with the mold set up so you can see how the boat looks, you know, with the molds in place. And again, after the frames and planking are in place, the molds are taken out. So the backbone, and I'll pass through this fairly quickly, is the stem, which is the bow part, the keel, which runs along the boat from front to back, and then the transom itself, and that's not actually on this picture, but the backbone defines the shape of the boat, and the molds are set up on the backbone. So the first thing you do is you build the backbone. Then you build, then you set the molds up on the backbone and proceed to planking and framing. This is just another shot of molds. They can be plywood, they can be built out of, out of uh, three quarter inch pine, which they frequently are. And like I said, once you're done, you toss them away. What's interesting about most of these boats is you can build them either way you want. You can build them traditionally or you can build them in a contemporary style. So on the left is a traditional Grandy skiff that was used in the Seattle Parks Department. 
uh, back in the 1950s. And on the right, that same boat design is uh, veneered with a big vacuum bag. So it's a way of teaching the students on a relatively small boat how to, how to do vacuum bagging. So you just build a form and you lay real thin sheets of veneer down over that form and you slather everything with epoxy and put a big uh, plastic bag around it and suck all the air out and the atmosphere forces that veneer down over the mold and when the epoxy dries, you've got a boat shape. It's pretty interesting. So contemporary methods, um, those are the, the five basic ones. Um, this is a sheet plywood skiff that I built for my brother as, a, as an example. You'll see a couple of pictures of this. The top picture on the left is uh, a local boat here in the Port Hadlock area. Uh, the bottom one is my brother and his daughter out on their inaugural cruise. And you can see the plans are really, really basic for this boat. Um, there's not a lot of curves in the boat. It's all sheet plywood. There's lots of straight corners. So for those of us who are just getting started, me included, it was not a complex boat to build. In fact, the designer says you can build this boat, which is 18 feet long and five feet wide, carries half a ton on four weekends out of regular old plywood that you buy at the lumber store. This is that scamp again, uh, kit, kit builder, uh, that you can build it from scratch if you want. Uh, starting with a table of offsets and plans, or you can buy the kit for it. Uh, these are very popular boats designed by that New Zealand designer, John Wellsford, uh, and they're all over the place. There's probably 400 have been built so far, which is quite a large number for a small boat. Um, and it goes together pretty quickly. When I was at the boat school, we would teach this course as a two-week assembly course up at the Northwest Maritime Center in the summers. For people and they would walk away after two weeks with a with a half-built boat that they could finish at home. Uh, lots of strip planking is another way to build boats and you can see the the molds in the middle of the uh, boat there holding the shape and then all you're doing here is nailing or stapling thin uh, square sheets of wood, uh, pieces of wood, the length of the boat to each other it makes for an extremely strong hull and after you're done it's fiberglass so that it's relatively impervious to damage. So what do you need? Um, I thought about that this morning when I was getting ready to do the presentation, so I added this slide. Uh, you need tools, of course. Uh, you need time. You should expect that it's going to take you three times as long as you think it's going to take you for everything. Uh, I forgot to mention patience. You need lots of patience, but I'll get to that. You need space, but you don't need a lot of space. I built an 18-foot boat in uh, 20 feet of space and uh, seven feet wide in my garage. So it took up half, half the garage and the tools are in the other half. I'll show you that. You need plans from a reliable designer that you can that you understand. And it took me, uh, when I started building that, that little skiff was uh, probably a couple of months of just looking at the plans and thinking through how I was gonna build it. Uh, curiosity, um, when you're starting or even when, you're, when you think you know what you're doing, you're gonna run into problems and it helps to ask questions of people. Uh, there's lots of small boat people in our area all over the place, and uh, they're almost always willing to help you. And uh, in my shop, I have what's called a moaning chair. So when I really run into something serious and can't figure it out, I go sit down and moan in the chair for a while and complain to myself and just sit out there and look. And I've also found that um, when I run out of energy and I've been in the house looking at the computer too much and I really don't want to be in the shop, I go out and sit in the moaning chair for a while and just look at things and pretty soon I'll start, the energy will come back and I'll say, okay, there's something I gotta do. I gotta fix this or I gotta work on that. And pretty soon I find myself working on the boat again. This is a basic hand tool kit. We don't need to really go into too much detail, but um, you really don't need a lot. Uh, hand tools, we're used to build boats all the way up into the 1880s because there wasn't any power tools, not even steam driven ones. So lots of nice boats were built. And these are all pretty basic tools. Um, the only real skill that helps is to, to learn how to sharpen. And uh, there's lots of videos now, so it's not an arcane art anymore. Now there's some nice to have power tools, a circular saw, a power drill, a, re a saber saw, or a router is always nice. I have a full shop, so you know I've built things up over time. Um, you can see on there all the rest of the stuff you might want. For epoxy work, it's always important to wear old clothes that you're going to throw away eventually because you're going to get epoxy all over everything, even if you try to work as clean as you can. So 
uh, long sleeve shirts and gloves and keep it off your face, a nice ventilation and all that kind of thing. This is just a list of books that are, might be useful to people. Uh, there's all kinds of videos out there. And uh, these are the best ones, I think. We actually have uh, the nation's premier small craft company is in Port Townsend called Duckworks. Uh, they were bought out by a small craft advisor magazine and now operate out of a, a fairly well-equipped warehouse up in the Port Townsend industrial area. Uh, so they are local. So you can go up there and personally go get all the stuff you need or they'll ship it overnight to you wherever you happen to be. Uh, Off Center Harbor is a nice video uh, company run out of the East Coast. Um, they focus a little bit more on East Coast boats than on West Coast boats. But if uh, you want to get some inspiration on what you can do, it's nice to look at videos from them. They're really quite good. And the rest of them are pretty basic locations and things to find out. Uh, websites that talk about Duckworks, uh, fisheries is an overnight service from Seattle. So anything you need for a boat, you can get from fisheries. Um, Small Craft Association is a national thing and there's lots of different sources for this. Uh, lots of magazines out there. I'm uh, partial to all the magazines that you see here and usually subscribe to them all. Um, lots of how-to magazines, uh, especially Small Craft Advisor and the Ash Breeze. Uh, Messing About in Boats is an East Coast magazine that is basically like the gravel road to boat building, uh, written by its readers. It's been in existence since the late 70s or early 80s. Uh, and it's probably the most enjoyable magazine because you get everything. You know, the reader writes the magazine, you know, the editor just sort of assembles it. So it's everything from building to using to racing to anything you might be interested in. And then these are just some pictures of, you know, I mentioned uh, USS Pledge, for example, she was built in Tacoma in 1955. This is the boat that really got me started on, on uh, wooden boats and ships. Her sister ship, the Implicit, was stationed down in Tacoma, and that's her in the upper right-hand corner, so you can get a nice side view of her. Um, interesting boat in that it was very heavily built, a uh, triple plank, believe it or not, of the best materials available in 1955. Had a aluminum block, diesel engines. Uh, in the older boats, when I started, they were Packard, uh, 12 cylinder main engines that had been used in blimps <laughs> in World War II and in PT boats, and then they ended up in the minesweepers. Uh, superstructure was plywood, so it was easy to take care of. Uh, while I was on the pledge, I also volunteered on the Arthur Foss, which I think everybody knows is over in Seattle, an old uh, tugboat built in 1889. Uh, she's a fantastic boat, just gone through several overhauls to make her last the next century. And then Blue Star, uh, the boat I started with in ownership anyway, was a 26-foot tug. She's down in uh, Kingston, I think, right now. I sold her a couple of years ago. I've always regretted doing that, but I had to sell one boat anyway. Uh, she was built at the Wooden Boat School in the late 1990s. I uh, went through a whole series of owners before I got her. Uh, had been up in Canada, and, and uh, wooden boats don't do too well outside if they're neglected, and so... Uh, the guy that had her had fixed her up partway, and then I bought her, and uh, we replaced the decks on her and so did some interior work. But anything on a wooden boat can be easily fixed. This is the Bidarka, which is really an interesting project. Uh, Corey Friedman is the builder, the, the instructor for this, uh, which is not associated with the wooden boat school. And so we're all used to, in the classes, working on ordinary wooden boats, and Corey brought one of his 21-foot uh, by dark as it was covered with uh, urethane uh, or neoprene fabric. And he's about 150 pounds or so. He put it up on a desk and jumped up and down on the front of the boat to show us how strong it was. So when I saw that, I went, holy smokes, I got to learn how to do this. So my wife and I took his two-week class in his uh, shop. You can see it's just a big tent shop, basically, with a, a rubber floor up there in Anacortes on the west side. and uh, we built the boat. He would tell us, okay, you have to do this, and then we did it. So he was not building the boat for us. My wife built her boat, and I built mine. Um, and those boats are built, as you can see, you build the bow and the stern first, and then you connect them with these outside, uh, what they call a shear plank, which runs along the outside of the boat. And then you put the, the frame, which is the way Elliot's did it, in between, and then you hang the ribs off that. So it's almost completely backwards from the traditional uh, European way of building small craft. 
Now, these boats were used for hunting. Uh, they were usually single or double hull, but there's also triples, uh, what they called three hull by darkest. They were used for seal hunting and that kind of thing along the Aleutian coast up until around 1910 or so was the last one was built. Now they're being built again. This is that uh, plywood works gift that I built for my brother. He decided to hang a 30 horse mercury on the back, which makes it go like smoke. Uh, so you have to weigh the front end down. So he put his daughter up in the front to keep the bow down when he's running it. But he and I go fishing every summer in Northern Wisconsin uh, when the pandemic is not whacking us. And uh, the boat is kept pretty much outside although it has a canvas cover now and it's doing just fine. Uh, and like I said, anything on, the, on a wooden boat can be very easily repaired. He's bumped the pier a couple of times. We just patch it up and paint it and keep going. The boat can be painted with latex, latex house paint, which is what the designer calls for. And you let the paint just wear off the boat. And when it wears off far enough, you just sand it down and repaint it, real simple. This is a little traditional dinghy I'm working on at the moment. And all that junk in the background is in my garage shop. Um, this boat is actually built like a canoe by the Old Town Canoe Company in Maine. And uh, you can see it's got wide frames or wide ribs. And then there's cedar planking on the outside, which is extremely thin. And then a layer of canvas is actually on the outside of that, just like a traditional canoe is built. The advantage to this is it makes it quite light. So it's easy to lift on and off your boat. And the last picture is uh, Riptide. She was built in 1927 by the Scherzer Brothers Shipyard in the north end of Lake Union. And when I got her, she was in pretty sad shape, but that's not too surprising for an 85 year old boat. And uh, so she has been replanked from the water line up. She's got a new pilot house now, a new engine, fuel tanks, hydraulics, all that kind of stuff. And right now I'm in the painting mode. So she's kept down in Port Ludlow. And this is a little wooden boat that I've always liked that a guy built out in Montana and he trailers this boat all over the place. So we've seen it many times out here on the Puget Sound. I think he's uh, in his early 70s now. It's uh, Jim Mikulak is a designer that lives in Illinois. And uh, this is a Mike's boat. So you can see this boat has blunt ends on both ends. So it maximizes its internal space. Uh, it's actually pointing towards us. So the bow is at the right. That little thing sticking out the back is just to keep the help the sails. And uh, you can sleep two adults on it. So they're out in, it, this picture was taken in Matt's Matt's Bay. They were just getting up in the morning, getting ready to sail off. So you can do all kinds of different things with boats. You know, everything from being out on the ocean or the sailor sea down to a small craft um, sailing around in the Puget Sound or on lakes and rivers. So that's, that's why I like it. And that's my, my presentation. I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you so much, Pete. Um, I think we have a little time for questions if people have any. Yeah, I've got I've got a question there, Pete. Uh, have you found sure. that uh, uh, over the past year, you know, the cost of uh, lumber has gone through the roof? Uh, yeah. Is that uh, does that hinder and uh, or are you do you uh, also do they also uh, offer a thing where I know a lot of boat builders like to mill their own wood. So, uh, you know, as far as frames and stuff like that, so. We, uh, we're fortunate to live in an area that is, that is just filthy rich in all the different things you need to build <laughs> boats. It's incredible. I mean, I, I am on a number of different uh, channels online and you hear people complaining they can't even find fallen trees to mill up you know and here we've got trees all over the place and you see them just laying on the side of the road you know and and they're good trees for boat building so you know if you can't find white oak you can use maple it won't last as long but you know 15 years is a long time um and if you're judicious uh you know i wouldn't be building a, a new traditional boat every couple months if i did if i wasn't selling them for example because that it does get kind of expensive but I mean, we've got three major hardware companies right in the area, you know, Aero Lumber and uh, Headlock Hardware. And then we've got the place over on 19, I think of the name off the top of my head. And then of course you got Edensaw, which is like Nirvana. You walk into Edensaw and there's probably 10,000 square feet of every kind of wood you can possibly imagine. And then some, and then all their milling capacity. If you don't have your own equipment, they'll do it for you. Plus all the different plywoods you need. 
And so there's just an amazing amount of material available. And, and, you know, to build a small boat like this, you just don't need a lot of material. This is probably a five or six plywood sheet boat, for example, the Mike's boat we're looking at on the screen at the moment. Uh, it takes probably two or three gallons of epoxy, which is probably a couple of hundred bucks and some latex porch paint, you know, that kind of thing. So it, it's just not very expensive. And yet this boat's been all over the entire Northwest, not to mention Montana, Idaho, you know, that kind of thing up into Canada. So it, just a simple trailer, a couple thousand bucks, unless you want to buy a used one and you're in business. Thank you. You're welcome. Thanks for the opportunity. Any other questions? I'm not sure, Kathy, how I give you questions. control back. Um, you can, you can, you're, since you're co-hosting, you can just unshare. Um, okay. Any other questions? I was wondering if the wooden boat show is going to happen this year or, or a different form of it. Um, <clears throat> that's a good question. I can't give you that answer. I believe that they've, they've decided to wait a couple of months. Normally at this time in March, they're registering boats for the show. Uh, so I think they're going to start that in May. And I'm, I believe that they're guessing that we probably can do it. Uh, but you know, it was, it was canceled last year. Yeah. Uh, the, a, a group on the East coast put together what's called the virtual boat show. Uh, which just concluded in early March. They ran it for two weeks and it was wildly popular. They had probably 500 boats from all around the world uh, for wooden boat enthusiasts to look at. So videos and stills and interviews with builders and designers and the whole nine yards was available for five bucks for two weeks. It was incredible. Wow. So I think that the Northwest Maritime Center or the Wooden Boat Foundation might use some hybrid form of that where, you know, if we really can't get together and in uh, the second weekend in September, then they'll go to some kind of an online show. At least I hope they do. It's really, uh, if people haven't been to that boat festival, if there's probably 35,000 of your closest friends show up for three or four days. It starts, you know, the night before is always a free kind of a thing. So if you want to come and not pay the entry fee, just come the night before it opens and walk in and all the boats are already there and everybody's having a great time. And by Sunday, three in the afternoon, everybody's gone. You know, they all go home that day. So it's just a lot of fun. Wonderful. Any other questions? So thank you so much, Pete. It's, it's so nice to have such talent in our Rotary community and um, we'll see you hopefully soon. Yep, thanks very much, Kathy, appreciate it. Yes.